Hi, everybody. Um, I am not Mike Friedlander. I'm Reed Montague. Mike was called away for family, the last minute for family business. I'm the introducer today, um, which I was going to be anyway, but I'm the introducer of the Pioneers in Biological Biomedical Research Seminar series for the day. Today, we have a very uh, exciting speaker, someone who I've known um, known of, certainly since for my whole career, Corbana Bohan from Stanford University. Um, I'll start by introducing him and then saying a few words about, um, well, I'll just say uh, the next uh, Pioneers in Biomedical Research uh, installation is, seem, is October 1 right now. Uh, another one is up in the air. So I'm gonna hold off on saying exactly who and what's next. But today we have a real pioneer uh, in biomedical research, certainly a pioneer in neuromorphic engineering Kobana Bohan. He's a professor of bioengineering, electrical engineering at Stanford University. Um, he uh, is, in my opinion, one of the leading lights in uh, what used to be called, or still is, very BLSI analog engineering, uh, neuromorphic engineering, and is sort of leading the way, talking about the role of AI in uh, neurobiology, the study of neurobiology, and, and you know how it's going to enter our lives. Um, he has an enormous number of distinctions. I will only name the top 10, let's say. Uh, he has, in 2011, uh, was awarded the uh, NIH Director's Transformative Award. In 2006, he was awarded the NIH Director's Pioneer Award. He was a winner of the Young Investigator Award of the Office of Naval Research the National Science Foundation Faculty Early Career Program, NSA Career Awards, we all know about those. Those are quite prestigious. The Packard Foundation in 1999, Fellowship in Science and Engineering. Uh, he was a member of the Caltech Sloan Center for Theoretical Neurobiology. Uh, he's a fellow of the Institute for Medical and Biomedical Engineering, a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. Um, and the list goes on. Uh, the key here is to optimally tell somebody we recognize who they are without embarrassing them too much. Anyway, uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to him. And I think you will see a connection to many parts of the research going on here at Virginia Tech, both in engineering, uh, in neurobiology and in human neuroscience. So Quivana, nice to have you and thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks a lot for the uh, invitation and, and for reconnecting. Looking forward to talking to you more uh, read uh, when we meet later today. Um, and uh, uh, it would have been great if I could have been out there on the East Coast, uh, but here we are. <laughs> so, so, um, so yeah, so um, the, the topic of my seminar today is the future of artificial intelligence, a 3D silicon brain. And one of the few benefits of COVID and working from home has been the opportunity to think deeply about, you know, all the work that I've done in the last three decades in this area and um, try to then also think deeply about where technology is headed and how we can solve a lot of problems that plague us from sustainability and, and you know, personally, uh, you know, keeping our information to ourselves and all that. And, um, and so, yeah, so this is what I'm going to talk about. I haven't built any of this stuff. It's just where I think, and it, we, 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 as uh, a vision for like neuromorphic computing based on um, the just totally um, awesome and mind uh, changing, you know, uh, earth shattering discoveries that have been made about dendrites, which, you know, are very interesting. Uh, much more interesting than people thought. So, 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 yeah. So, I'm synthesizing information across all these areas, and um, I think this is what it takes to really do innovative and pioneering work. And um, and I hope you guys will find it interesting. Um, I'm sure my clock is ticking, and so let me just <laughs> uh, dive in. But uh, yeah, thanks for the wonderful introduction, uh, Reed. So. This is, uh, I'm just gonna read this. I taught myself everything I know just by reading the internet. And now I can write this column. This is a quote from GPT-3. I'll explain a little bit later what it is. 
the mission for this continuing with GPT-3, the mission for this op-ed is perfectly clear. I am to convince as many human beings as possible not to be afraid of me. And here's a quote from the editor of the Guardian uh, news magazine, which published a column that GPT-3 wrote. Editing GPT-3's op-ed was no different to editing a human op-ed. We cut lines and paragraphs and rearranged the order of them in some places. Overall, it took less time to edit than many human op-eds. So the Guardian editor is saying that uh, this GPT-3 is performing at a human level and is making very cogent arguments about why we should not be afraid of uh, robot overlords, right? You know, <laughs> so like the quote from the, uh, the Jeopardy uh, competition, but with uh, Watson. But anyway, so what is GPT-3? So GPT-3 is like the state of the art in what's called language model. These are enormous neural networks that are able to, you cue them with some prompt, for example, like recite the first law of robotics. And they start, once they ingest that prompt, the model starts to then generate text. A robot may not injure a human, a human being, right? And that's the correct response, right? And the way it works is it can be basically fed a prompt of up to something like 1500 words, which uh, are called, are represented as tokens. I'll explain a little bit later what that means about one and a half words per token. And so it can, it has a, a memory context or it's looking at the last 2048 tokens of text that it ingested and generated or generated, right? And those tokens are represented as vectors. So there's a vector representing A and there's a robot and so on and so forth. This is called a word embedding. You're taking words and you're embedding them in a high dimensional vector space. That, that has something to do with language, who would have guessed, right? But that's what we're doing here, okay? Now, so then what you do is, or what the network or the, it's a, the neural network does is that it passes these vectors through a stack of these layers, your know, normal kind of layers of neurons with weights and interconnects and so forth. But each of these transformer decoder layers has some like three layers of those uh, traditional neural networks, you know. And they are arranged in a particular way that that's something that's called attention, scale dot product attention. I don't have time to go into it, but it's not the kind of attention that read studies. It's a mathematical form of way of doing it. I explain what it, it, it is, it, it, um, but it's analogous. It's performing an analogous role, role okay? And so in this case, as these, uh, as, as these, let me, let me move my, um, yeah, as, as, as these, uh, you know, yeah, so, so that's what's happening. And it's, called, it's what's called an autoaggressive model. So once it ingests all these vectors, then it generates a vector that is what it thinks or what it expects. It's trained to sort of predict the next word in some text. So the text is feeding through, they feed it tons of text, like a trillion words of text. And it's the way they train it is unsupervised. So it's just, they hide the next word in some segment of text, and then it has to predict that. So the vector that comes out after you feed it this text should be the next word in the text, like from the internet or something like that. My camera is freezing, let me reset it. But, um, and, and so, so that's what's happening in GPT-3. And um, what you get then when you do that is the deeper or the more layers you, you stack and the more context that you give the, um, the, the, the more context that you give the, um, oh, sorry, can you see my, okay, let's move to the next slide. Can you see, my, is my camera on? Can you see? We cannot see you. Okay, let me see. Where that is. The, the moving you, that is. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Okay, let me fix it. Oh, okay. 
Oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, 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 what this uh, slide was saying is, you know, as you stack more layers of these transformer decoders, and as you pay attention, the model gets wider and deeper. It's paying attention to a larger segment of preceding text. Its performance gets better and better. Okay, so. This, there was a paper called Attention is All You Need that introduced this attention mechanism in 2017. And then in 2018, OpenAI jumped on this and introduced GPT-1, which was a bigger version of that original model called BERT. And um, then in 2019, they, they released GPT-2, 1.5 billion parameters. And in 2020, they released GPT-3. And so this is GPT-3 that you wrote that column that I quoted from. And so we've had over a um, three years, a 96, an eightfold increase in, in, in um, decoder layers or the depth of the height of the stack from 12 to 96, right? And we've also had an increase in the dimensionality of these vectors that are representing these tokens that are representing words, 16 fold, you know, from 768 components to 12,288 components. That's called the model dimensionality. And, uh, and so if you, the, the product of these two things is to increase the total number of parameters 1500 fold from 117 million parameters, these weights in your neural network that you're training to 175 billion, okay? Which is, sounds like a big number of it. It actually will fit into your iPhone 13, which has a terabyte of memory. Okay, now so um, so 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 this to put that in context. Now, but you know, and you know, if you think of these weights as synapses in the human brain, you know, this is like 10 to the 11, and the number of synapses we have in the human brain is like 10 to the 15 or 14, right? So. So a thousand fold, but yeah. So, so, so now, but what we are finding, so what we're finding is that the impress that it becomes more human-like and more intelligent and all that stuff, you know, as we make these models bigger, but it takes more, even more uh, resources to train these models as they get bigger. In other words, that, that's just taking off with a, with a power law. And in this case here, we are plotting sort of the errors that it makes in predicting the next word. So lower is fewer errors against the amount of compute that we use to train the model. And the downward trend you're seeing here is that yeah, if you train for longer and longer, you can get better and better. The model gets better and better at predicting the next word. Okay, now this compute is in units of petaflop days. Okay, so petaflop is a computer that does 10 to the 15 floating point operations per second. Okay, it's about uh, the same number of times your synapses in your brain fire per second. Okay, uh, so kind of on that level, it's like a as powerful as the brain. And um, that computer, if you run that computer for a day, that's the amount of compute that we are plotting here. Okay, so this 10 to the four is running that computer for 10,000 days, okay? <laughs> so this is a lot of compute, only the hyperscalers like OpenAI, Google, and all these guys can do that, right? You know, us academics are being left in the dust. Okay, so, so, so but you know, what are these different colored curves? Okay, so these different colored curves can correspond to different, size models increasing from darker to lighter colors as the legend here shows. So you're seeing a model with 100,000 parameters up to a model with 100 billion or 175 billion, right? So that's GPT-3, the biggest one, and its predecessor was GPT-2, you see right here. Okay, with, um, I think it's 1.5 billion, okay? Now, and so what you see is like in GPT-2's case, as we used more compute, the error dropped and dropped, right? I, I think I animated this. So the weights increased 117 fold from GPT-2 to GPT-3. And then the flops, you know, so if you follow the GPT-2 uh, curve, the errors are dropping and at some point it hits this asymptote where the rate at which errors are dropping becomes less, you know, like you can see these knees in this curve. 
And so then at that point, you're actually better off training, it will asymptote to an error, you know, coming around here. And then you're better off training a bigger model with more compute and it will asymptote at a lower error, right? And so then you end up, because you also have to increase the amount of data, the number of words or text that you scour from the internet and feed into these models to predict, you know, you have to also increase that, but only like fivefold versus 117 times more weights, right? And so the total amount of compute that you increase by is a factor of 570. And that drops the error only by a factor of like 1.4, okay? Because the exponent on this power law is like 120, okay? So, so, so this is the thing, right? It's getting better and better, but the compute you need is just exploding, right? Uh, you know, to drop the error by a factor of two, you have to increase the number of flops by two to the 20, which is a million fold. Okay, this is insane. Okay, <laughs> so 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 so, um, but this is what we. But you know, it's getting better. Okay, and so kind of we face this conundrum, like we found something that really works, but it's brutally you know expensive to do, right? So that's the part we are missing here. Now, um, you know, so GPT three costs like four point six million dollars to train. You know, you pay some like two dollars an hour per GPU core on the cloud service. And, you know, but you need tons, like 10,000 of them because you need to get 10 to the four, you know, uh, you know, it should take you like 10,000 days, right? But if you deploy 10,000 GPUs, you can do this in two weeks, okay? And the amount of pollution, you know, carbon footprint that these GPUs, the electricity they're consuming is generated, is, is, is uh, uh, they're consuming, you know, the amount of carbon that, it emits when you generate it is like the same amount of carbon that a thousand three hundred cars will emit if they were running for the same amount of time two weeks okay you know just your average amount of car use in two weeks so 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 this is just put it in context in, in context right and it turns out that these language models actually kind of like uh the most difficult, the, the exponent on them is the is the is the high, is the is the smallest, right? Um, but in general, you see these sort of power law trends for all these different neural network models for different tasks. So this plot here is showing you, you know, tasks like language modeling, vision, you know, recognition, um, games, you know, like Doha, you know, you heard about that with uh, these competitions that you play against the computer speech recognition, which translates your speech to other languages and so forth, generates these captions automatically on videos and so forth. Um, and these kinds of things, these are all these, these neural networks, and also this very deep, very wide, we're using a lot of compute. And if you now look at this trend here from 19, you know, 97, uh, this is actually in that talk here is what got me excited about neural networks. You know, I was a freshman in 1985. And in 97, I had a talk, in 1996, 86, sorry. <laughs> I, I had a talk from Terry Sejnowski, who was Reed Montague's uh, advisor at the SOC about this net talk, which only had three layers of neurons of these uh, units in a neural network. And he had trained it to take text and convert it to speech. In other words, it would take the text and it will convert it to the phonemes that you needed to pronounce that made up the, the sound for that word. And these phonemes he played through a vocoder, which is a thing that Bell Labs or at and built that, you know, you could, it made these computerized voices, right? And so it was a really fantastic demo, you know, and, you know, as you sort of read, as, as you started editing and training, it just sounded like bubble from a baby and you didn't understand anything. And midway, it was kind of the baby talk that the parents could understand, only the parents. <laughs> and later on, it was like, wow, this thing is, is, is reading. You can hear, you can understand. Okay, so that was back, way back in the day. And that got us excited. That was kind of the first wave of neural, or, or there were waves before that, but that was the wave that I caught, got me excited and as a neural network. And you can see here, the amount of compute people were using to train what I call state of the art, the best model at that time was increasing like Moore's law. You could, it was doubling every two years, which means that you didn't need, you just had to buy a new computer and you would get more compute, 
and you would use the same amount of electricity and you wait the same amount of time. I mean, you train a bigger model, but it will use the same amount of electricity, twice bigger and the same. Yeah, so that was great. And this is what they call the normal scaling. If you're scaling faster than that, then that's hyperscaling, okay? And that started around 2012 here, where we entered this era here. This is kind of the second wave that I experienced where you know these neural networks started just breaking and winning all these competitions with you know, um, AlexNet and those kinds of things you might have heard about. You can see AlexNet right here. And now kind of like, you know, these state-of-the-art models are using twice as much compute to train every three and a half months. And the language models that I showed you, which are really difficult to train, that's doubling every two months, okay? So that's like 64 times more compute <laughs> from year to year. It's insane, I, you know, so, so that means more money because you're going faster than more slow. You really have to just deploy more of these GPUs and burn more electricity, all the stuff. Otherwise you'll be waiting forever, okay? <laughs> yeah, so, so, so that's where we are. And so if you, you know, now show the impact of this kind of thing, like this is the amount of energy in gigawatt hours that Google's data centers are using, which have tripled more than triple since 2012 when this sort of uh, hyperscaling era began and, and uh, thanks to GPUs uh, being adapted to, to train these networks in a massively parallel way. And so that's just giving you some context of where we are in terms of you know, state of the art of neural networks or deep neural networks as they've been sort of rebranded in, in, in this era, right? And, um, and that sets the context for like, how do we actually make this more sustainable? And how do we cut the umbilical cord to the data center where you send all that data, all that speech, all the stuff, and they have all that data. And as my student said, yeah, you know, but you know, I'm looking for what they can give me for free. And they already have all my data. <laughs> Right. Okay. So, 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 but it's not just that the experience could be very different. The way we're using this technology could be very different. A lot more people could have a say in how we use it. Right. And so forth. And so think about let's, let's envision a different kind of future, which we do have the potential to realize. Okay. And this is mainly what the talk is about. And, um, so, so, so I kind of have this vision of my a librarian in your pocket or AI for all as um, Fei Fei Li, uh, my colleague in, in computer science calls it. And, um, you know, like GPT-3, it's read all of Wikipedia. You can ask it any complicated technical question and it will tell you. And if you don't understand, you can ask it a question, it will tell, you know, you can say, oh, but what about, you know, and so forth. So we can be having much more, um, rewarding, in my view, <laughs> you know, you could have less like have a librarian in your pocket, right? And, but right now you can't do that, right? Because you're going to be using GPT-3 or you're using any of these deep neural network models, they are run on the cloud in what's called batch mode. So, you know, you're translating some speech on your phone or, you know, you tell, ask Siri something and she has to respond, they load a neural network into that GPU and they batch your request and about 100 or 150 of them together and then they pump them together to that model, right? So you imagine the context that GPT-3 is working on, that they can only, you know, do this context of that model, they pump them all through and it hasn't, they are not contiguous, so we can't continue a conversation, right? And, and, but this is done because otherwise the GPUs are not efficient. You know, most of the overhead is loading, you know, models back and forth, right? And storing all that state, okay? So, 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 so in order to really have AI for all, we really have to run these things on our own devices. And like I told you, an iPhone already has enough memory to store GPT-3. What else, what benefits will you get if you're able to do this? Of course, you save energy, right? We already have these phones. They have the compute, they have the, the memory capacity. And you know, we're charging them and we don't, you know, so so we'll save energy. We don't need to deploy more and more data centers as this technology gets because we 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 just yeah, and then and then it's more personal, right? Of course, there's a we can these phones can run locally on a batch size of one. We we have to re-architect things more like the brain for that to happen, but we'll talk about that. 
And 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 so I could have a I could remember the context. I could continue to converse. We could go deeper into the conversation and so forth, right? And then of course we it will run in real time, right? I'm not waiting for that annoying delay. I say something, I have to actually finish the whole sentence and stop. And then I wait and then Siri says something. And, and a lot of times she doesn't say anything. She just gives me a bunch of links. I have to go and look. It's like, oh, is that the correct? You know, this is not how we converse with people. And she doesn't ask me any kind of clarifying questions. Like, did you mean this or do you mean that? And then, you know, yeah, that's what we expect. Right? You don't just give me some random answer. You give me, you, you, if you don't understand, you ask me, right? This is how we do. So, you know, I can't use it. And, you know, the kids play around with it, but, you know, they, they are much more patient than I am. So, so, and then of course your data could be secure, right? It doesn't leave your device. And, you know, it's, it's your data and, and uh, they don't get it for free. <laughs> okay, so, so um, that's, kind of like the, what the future could be, okay? And, you know, we can get into a larger discussion with the postdocs and the students at the, at the, in the next hour, but I always get this question that, you know, um, you know, things about, uh, let me put it this way, you know, my position is that technology is neutral, okay? And, you know, the more powerful the technology gets, the more it amplifies the values of the society. Okay, so if you want our values to be amplified by this technology, then we should democratize the technology so we can all decide what to do with it. Okay, if we don't democratize the technology, then a lot of people, some few people will get to decide which values of the society get amplified by that technology. Okay, so that's the way I look at it. Okay, so now, um, Let's let's talk about, you know, okay, so this is the vision, this is the bright side <laughs> of the vision. How do we make this happen? Well, you know, if you run the numbers, your iPhone's processor will need to be 15-fold faster to be able to run GPT-3 in real time. That means we can have a conversation, right? It's doing, it's processing the words at the rate of normal rate of conversation. And uh, which is fine, you can get there. And uh, but the big problem is that that 15 full fast, faster processor running all day will use will need some 800 184 bigger battery okay and of course we we don't want our phones to be 184 bigger okay so that's not going to happen and 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 so how do we basically how do we use less energy 184 less energy so that we can do this on the same size battery in our phone okay and this is the vision of neuromorphic computing, you know, you know, when I got to graduate school at Caltech in 1990, uh, Calvin Mead had been working on this, you know, since the early 80s actually, and he published a book in 89 called Analog VLSI and Neural Systems. And you know, this is the uh, this is kind of like and and the vision at that time, and he actually coined the term. Neuromorphic computing as the title, Neuromorphic Electronic Systems was the, was the title of a paper I published in 92. Okay. And so, and the, he always emphasized, you know, he had extrapolated, in fact, he coined the term Moore's Law. So he understood how technology evolves over time. And so he had extrapolated it goes away on this very nice uh, power law. He, 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 he understood, actually, an exponential, he, he understood that. Um, where the technology was going to go and ultimately how much compute we could do and how little energy we could use. And he compared that with the energy that the brain used and he extrapolated at the end of Moore's law, you know, which happened in 2004, 2006, it stopped scaling, giving us less, you know, giving us more compute for less energy and all that. But um, at the end of Moore's law, he extrapolated that computers will still be a million fold less energy efficient than the brain. So you want to do brain-like things, we would need these data centers that are powered by their own nuclear reactors, something like that, right? <laughs> a million times more energy. 20 watts, you need 20 megawatts. The brain is 20 watts, so you need 20 megawatts. And this is what we are seeing. That's how we're doing this now, okay? And so um, and so, what is the, the principle? So, so the way Carver put it was, these, we should redesign these computing systems based on the brain's organizing principles, okay? But, you know, what are the brain's organizing principles, okay? 
You know, if we look at the brain, which this, uh, you know, the figure here is showing on the right, you know, this, these are different spatial scales and these are different temporal scales. And you can see that, you know, if you look at structures in the brain from like ion channels all the way to the full brain, right? We go from a spatial scale of like nanometers to almost like meters or centimeters, right? You know, and that's six decades, right? And not only that, the, these structures also have different time scales, right? So these ion channels switch in the order of tens of nanoseconds uh, whereas the whole brain is working, uh, working on the order of seconds or fractions of a second, definitely more, yeah, if you take into account short-term memory mechanisms. And so that, that's the idea. So, so and biologists know about a lot. In fact, people specialize this. You just work on ion channels, you just work on synapses and so on and so forth. And so we know a lot of information about what's going on in all these levels. But the question is like, you know, what gives it that awesome efficiency, okay? And, you know, what, and that comes down to what is the right level of abstraction that we should, you know, use in our computers to capture this awesome efficiency of the brain. And so that comes with like some certain features we have to throw out. <clears throat> we have to make sure that we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? So we have to preserve features that endow the brain with this, what I call neural supremacy, right? It's able to do more compute, you know, solve bigger tasks, but the amount of energy it uses doesn't increase as fast as it increases in computers. It's like what we're seeing with GPT-3 on these GPUs. And so the, the, the um, you know, the, my thinking about this sort of, or my rethinking these questions that we've been grappling with over the last 30 years, um, you know, came from, it was inspired by quantum computing, right? And, um, you know, it's actually um, interesting that um, I think it was in like 1982 when Carbro got interested in neuro neuromorphic engineering or switched his research in that direction. Carbo Mead, um, John Hockfield, and Feynman, Richard Feynman taught a class called Physics of Computation. And in that class, Carver was talking about how, you know, this is how cells in the retina are connected and so forth. And we follow that blueprint, we can build an analog VLSI chip that did that, right? And then, you know, John Huffy was talking about, oh, you know, um, neural networks are these sort of like, you can think of them as a dynamical system where if you physically build a network, you can write down the amount of energy it's dissipating and it will naturally minimize that energy, go to the state which has the minimum energy to see. And so you could design your problem so that by minimizing that energy, you are minimizing the cost function of your neural network. Okay, and so again, it was this physical thing, you just build it and it would just <laughs> do it, right? Uh, by the natural dynamics and so forth of the, uh, of the, of the, of the physics physical properties. And then Feynman was talking about quantum computing in that class. Yeah, and, um, and, you know, and I, I wanna, you know, go with, with Feynman's thing, because this is something that inspired this whole line of thinking that I've been on in the last two years. And, and so we are talking about computing capacity, how does energy scale with problem size? And what Feynman said was, this is not determined by all these fancy algorithms you guys write and make a big deal out of. You know, fundamentally, you can write the most clever algorithm you could come up with. And you, you will get the exponent on this power law down, but there's a fundamental limit you're going to hit. And no amount of innovation, you know, smartness is going to do it, right? So what really determines that fundamental scaling law? It's the signaling codes. It's like how you encode information in the machine. And, you know, that determines, you know, um, how much energy it takes to move information around. And it's the operating primitives, which is like, you know, once you have that particular code for coding information, you need primitives to encode your information that way. So this is what the neurons are doing, you know, before they fire spikes, that's sort of an encoding of information into spikes, which are the forming which are your coding information. 
And when the spikes hit the dendrites, then you need things to decode that code. And then that's what the dendrites are doing. And so what are these codes and what are these primitives? Feynman is saying that you choose the right codes, you choose the right primitives, you change that exponent on that scaling model, okay? And in the case of a quantum computer, you can drop that from an exponential scaling, right? Where, you know, I make the problem four times harder, it increases by two to the four, like 16 fold more energy is used to a polynomial scaling where I make the, problem twice as hard, it becomes, if it's quadratic, then it just becomes four times more energy is used, okay? And you do that by replacing bits in your computer with qubits, that's how you represent the information. And the way you operate on the information is you replace conjunction or and operations with entanglement, and you replace disjunction or all, all, all logical operation with superposition. So he was able to show without any writing any algorithm that yes, you could just kill it. Like basically, and, and so then later on, John Presco also at Caltech coined, coined the stem neurons, uh, quantum supremacy, okay? In other words, this exponential to polynomial scaling means that quantum computers are supreme over classical computers. And so with apologies to John Presco, I borrowed that term and I call it neural supremacy. So how do we achieve neural supremacy? Okay, that's the question. Okay. Um, you know, I don't know everybody's following me, but I'm having a good time. I hope you guys are, are too. But uh, so, so, so how do we, you know, what is neural supremacy and how do we achieve it, right? And so to do that, you know, we have to, you know, think about physics and compute energy and all this stuff. Right, so we take a neural network and we have to calculate how much energy it uses as we increase the number of neurons in the neural network. And this is gonna follow some power law. It's gonna have some exponent. And if we can design a neural network that has a smaller exponent than the other one, then this is neural supremacy, okay? So how low can you go? Okay, so so we have to like first lay out the dimensions of the neural network, right? So what I've sketched here is one of these things would be a neuron in the network. And here when all the neurons, you know, the information is going down this way. So the neurons, you know, outputs, you know, here interact with all the inputs of the neurons in the other layer through these synapses as labeled here. And then, so then we have to wire all the stuff together, right? You know, send these outputs and neurons, outputs, and input where they need to be. And so we are gonna track the size of the network by looking at how wide it is, which refers to how many neurons there are in a layer and how deep it is, which refers to how many of these layers there are. And so therefore the total number of neurons, which are gonna call M is L times N, the width times the depth. So we wanna know as we increase M, how does the energy we're using scale? Okay, what's that exponent? And so then we're going to lay it out. We're going to wire it all up. <clears throat> and modern neural networks, you know, this generation of neural networks are not just pure feed forward networks, like the NetTalk network that uh, Terry demonstrated. They have these feed, they also have these recurrent connections, which are kind of going back, going within the layer. So you can see here that these neurons, their outputs go back into their inputs, right? That, that's, that would be this these connections going back, okay? And, and, and so that's a recurrent and, or a feedback connection. And then you have residual connections, which are, you know, instead of just going to the next layer, you skip it and you go to the, to, to the layer after that, or skip connections that can skip a lot of layers, okay? And so you need to sort of wire, put in all these wires, it's sort of a wiring nightmare, okay? But you know, you need to do this because to calculate the energy, you need to know the dimensions of the wires and so forth. You know, and I'll explain that. The reason you need to know that is, you know, from first principles, you know, the amount of energy that, you know, or amount of work that you do, okay, equals the force you apply times the distance that you apply, it, right? So distance is important for figuring out how much work you're doing and you need energy to do work, right? 
for an electrical signal, this then becomes energy you consume becomes proportional to the length of the wire. And that's what is shown here, okay? And you can think of it like filling a hose with water, right? So the longer the hose, the more water you got to sort of pump through it, right? That will be sent like a high signal. And then you deplete the water and then that will be a low signal, right? So, so, so the amount of water corresponds to the amount of electrical charge flowing in that wire. And the volume corresponds to what's called the capacitance of the wire, right? And so it tells you how much charge you have to, to put in there. And when you move charge around, you're doing work because charge you know, experiences a force from the electrical field. And so you have to overcome this force. So that's where the force is coming from, okay? And, um, and since the amount of charge you have to sort of move is proportional length of the wire because of that capacitance, then you get use energy proportional to the length of the wires. Or if you, if you have a shorter wire, you lose less energy. If you have a longer wire, you use a lot more proportionally more energy. So we care about the long wires that we have to run, okay? In this, across this chip to build this neural network. And so here is a layout of the neural network where you're seeing, you know, with this example here, I have 10 layers, each with 10 neurons, okay? And so my, my depth is 10, my width is 10, and the total number of neurons is 100. Okay, and so if I take this, you know, this is what I do, I'm a chip designer. I take this wiring diagram and I lay it out on a chip, right? I can basically, you know, each of these incoming 10 neurons here, let's just take this layer here. Each of these 10 neurons here wants to talk, of each of those ten, talk to each of those 10 neurons here. So basically I do a crossbar thing here where, you know, the first layers neurons, these uh, red lines, you know, are going horizontally and the other ones are going vertically. And at each intersection, I can put a synapse, you know, which you can just model with a single transistor. This is the analog approach. And then to run these residual feedback, recurrent, all those other connections, I need another set of wires here, which can go long distances, right? And in fact, talk to any crossbow in these 10, you know, layers, right? And so it turns out that I end up with a crossbar whose width and scales like n, the number of neurons in a layer. And then I, when I put L of those crossbars together, now my, my length of my wire is scaling like L times n. And so the amount of work I have to do is proportional to L times n, which is proportional to the total number of neurons. Okay. Now the number of signals, it's also proportional to the number of neurons because each neuron is sending a signal. So when I'm doing inference, I present something to with this layer and these neurons respond. And then I go to my weights and then I get input to the next layer of neurons and they respond and so forth, right? So these signals are flowing through the network. And so now if you mul mul multiply the number, the total number of energy that you need to consume is the amount of work each signal does times the number of signals. So that's gonna go like M squared. So now we've got an architecture that as we make the number of neurons in the system bigger, we use quadratically more energy, okay? So that's the exponent that we're after. So this is how it's gonna work in a 2D chip. And um, can we do better than this, right? To do better than this, well, like we just see here, right? You know, energy is work time signals. To reduce work, we have to reduce distance. To reduce signals, we have to sort of code information more efficiently, so not all these neurons respond. So we're gonna explore those two approaches. How do we reduce the distance and how do we reduce the number of signals? Now, so, so that exponent, we're not liking that exponent, but this there's a nice part here, which is that the area of the chip is also scaling like M squared, right? Because it's like L times N times L times N. And so that means that the area is getting bigger at the same rate that the amount of energy we are using is getting larger. So that means the temperature of the heat is, oh, the temperature of the chip is not gonna increase. It's just going to, everything's gonna work well. So it's not gonna fry a hole in your pocket. So that's the good news, okay? Okay. So to make an analogy, right? In terms of reducing distances and reducing energy, I'm gonna make an analogy between Los Angeles, you know, where I was spent six years in graduate school uh, and Manhattan, okay, New York, right? So 
if you know what we do <laughs> is you know and if you experience that you know you get tired of it because there's this suburban sprawl and you spend all your time driving and you know very little time in your office because of all the commute and so forth and so reducing the distances you travel well, you spend less time commuting, right? And you can do that by going 3D, like in Manhattan, right? So you just pack everything vertically in 3D, you shorten the distances, and, you know, people are spending more time in the office, and less time commuting, right? And chips are full, have followed the, the Los Angeles model for the last 50 years. This is what Moss Law is about. And Moss Law now has to go to increase the number of transistors you know, we can't make the cars any smaller, we can't make the people any smaller, you know, so this is where we've reached. And most of all, we shrunk the transistors so much that the electrons are complaining that, you know, they are bumping into the other electrons, it's like too crowded here. So I want to move to New York or, or something, but anyway, so, 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 so to do, so to do, um, yeah, so we have to just start packing things in the third dimension, right? Like they do in Manhattan. And so if you now look at a 3D model of a chip here, you know, you can take all your crossbars and you can just stack them, right? And so now what you see is that, you know, your dimensions are, you know, as follows, you know, the length of, you know, you still have these crossbars that are N by N, and then you stack L of them, right? And it turns out that these transistors and these wires are so small that you can stack a thousand layers and you can still be less than a millimeter, like a hundred, a tenth of a millimeter at all. Whereas the dimensions of the chip I measured in centimeters. Right. And so now your longest wires are these wires. The height is negligible. And so now the work you have to do is proportional to n. Right. And um, the signals are still proportional to m because we haven't touched that. And so the amount of energy we are dissipating is n times m. And if we scale n like the square root of the number of neurons, you know, so. If we have a system with 10,000 neurons, you could do like 100 layers deep and 100 neurons wide, that kind of thing. Then you get an exponent, which is now three halves. So this solution is supreme to the first one, right? Because 3D shortens distances. So that's the good news. But the bad news is that if you now look at how your um, area is scaling, Remember I said that the height is negligible. So most of your area is in the top of the bottom surfaces. That's scaling like N squared. Whereas, so that's scaling because N scales like square root of M. That's scaling like the total number of neurons. So you have area to dissipate this heat that the energy you're consuming is converted to. Um, that's increasing linearly in the number of neurons, but the amount of energy is, is, sorry, the heat is increasing like the energy, like the three halves power, but the amount of air you can dissipate the heat that's produced, which is proportional, also proportional to three halves power, is increasing linearly, okay? So your chip is gonna get hotter and hotter as you make it bigger. You make more neurons and so forth. This is the problem in 3D. You know, there's a huge thermal constraint, okay? And so how do you solve that? Well, we already shortened the distances, so we already reduced the signals, okay? And so now the question is like, how do you code information more efficiently, okay? And this is, the, you know, I'm going to sort of show you how this works just by studying how these neural, deep neural networks are operating. And then I'm going to show you that actually it's telling us something very fundamental about the brain. It actually predicts, and it predicts an efficient way of coding signals. And I'm going to show you evidence that that's actually how, what the brain is doing. And so, so when we go 3D, we become uh, solutions so that we have to use become even more neuromorphic. In fact, neuromorphic now makes perfect sense, okay? In 2D, not so much, okay? <laughs> because you just don't have the wires like you see here, okay? And so, 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 so let's go back to the Manhattan, Los Angeles analogy because this sort of carries true, okay? So, so, so by here is the point I made that, you know, since you don't have the area to dissipate the heat you're generating, you can't operate all these wires, signals, all these signals and all these synapses all can't be activated in parallel. You have to activate serially, okay? And that's actually how the memory in your phone works. It's already 3D. It's got like 176 of these layers. 
of transistors. In this case, each transistor is a memory cell that stores one, two, three, or four bits of information. And by, you know, you only access one layer at a time and read or write some bits to that. And so you don't have this thermal, you will create security and you don't have this thermal problem. But we can't do that because we want to compute. We want parallel operation. So we get, we can do a lot of computation. And so what the Los Angeles Manhattan analogy tells us is that, you know, if you go to Manhattan and you're an Angelino, you realize that, you know, you don't see all this four or five traffic, right? People are, this is what you see here, right? They don't let you drive your car to Manhattan. They, they, they charge you tolls, they make parking, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, why do they do that? Because, you know, you've shortened the distances, people have shorter commutes, but the distances are shortened linearly, okay? So, you know, those shorter distances, you're gonna pollute less on those shorter distances. But the area over which you're gonna dissipate that smog is also reducing quadratically, not linearly. So that even though you're releasing less smog, it's actually becoming more concentrated over a smaller area. You couldn't live in Manhattan if you let people drive their cars. And so this is why you take, you're putting the subways and each trolley with the same pollution as your car pollutes, it can move 30, 40, 50 people, okay? And in our case, then, so you can think of this as, you know, the same signal, a signal is dissipating the same amount of energy, but it's carrying more bits of information. So you need fewer signals, right? And then that way you can reduce that, the, the total amount of energy, right? You can reduce the heat and you can make it all work. And so if you work that part out, you know, what is this signal that can carry more bits of information? Um, the way you can do that is you can switch from a binary number system to an entry number system. And you can code these entry numbers by using space as well as time. Okay, so I'll work you, I'll show you two examples. So a digit symbol, you know, so the number is made out of digits and the symbol that it represents, that is zero, one, two, up to nine in the case of a decimal number system, you code as the position of the signal in, time, in space, like which neuron is sending a signal, okay? That's your telling you which digit is in that place, okay, of the number. And then the place you code as where the signal is in time. So did this signal fire first, second, or third? Then that's the first, second, or third digit, the first, second, or third place of the number. Okay, so an example will look like this for a binary number system, which corresponds to two array, right? Either the neuron zero or five, you want to send a zero, or neuron one or five, you want to send a one, and the number you end up sending is one, zero, one, right? And for a um, entry or a decimal number system, you'd have 10 neurons, and this is how you send the number 239, okay? Now, of course, neurons don't work in groups of two or in groups of 10. Each layer of neurons has like 1,000, 10,000. Each layer of neurons has like 10,000 neurons. And so that will be a 10,000 RE number system, which I just call NRE, right? And, and what I'm showing here is that a binary system, because you have two choices, <laughs> each signal carries one bit of information. But decimal system, because you have 10 choices, each signal, it's a log number of choices, carries 3.3 bits of information. And for an entry number system, <clears throat> since you have n neurons to choose which is going to signal, each signal is going to carry log to the base two n bits of information, which is much higher. For a thousand, that will be ten bits of information. So it's much higher than what you can carry with a binary signaling, which is fundamentally limited to one bit. And in fact, if you look at you calculate the actual bits of information, it's much less than that. Okay, so. Here, just to remind you what this entry I'm talking about here is the number of neurons in a layer, okay? That's the N here in this entry number. And then we divide the total number of neurons by N to get the layers in how deep the network is. And so if you actually uh, do this entry coding and you understand the way in which the data is distributed in that you know, talk, we talk about these words as embedded in a vector space, and that's a 12,000 dimensional space. 
And so the question is that, do those words live equally distributed to all those 12,000 dimensions, or are they on some lower dimensional sp space or what's called a manifold, right? And that is the case. These words, even though they live they're embedded in a 12,000 dimensional vector, in the case of GPT-3, people have found that they live in like a hundred dimensional manifold, much lower dimensionality than the ambient dimensionality. It's like an example of a manifold is shown here where I have a 2D manifold embedded in a 3D space. Okay, those points will be the data points, like the words where those vectors end up, okay? And then, if, so if you take this into account that data lives on these kind of low dimensional manifolds, and then you take into account how neurons respond to data points, and basically that can be drawn as follows. Each neuron is active when the data point is on one side of some plane that cuts through that, the ambient dimensions and is not active on the other side, okay? Then you can calculate how many total different, you know, regions it's slicing the data that the data manifold into. And that number is going to increase exponentially with the dimensionality of the manifold, not the ambient dimensionality. Okay, so I'm going to skip this math because I'm tied for time. But basically, you can work all this stuff out. And the bottom line is that you find out that if you use these NRE signals, the number of NRE signals you need, the sequence, how long the sequence of spikes is, you know, how many places are in that number corresponds to, you know, how many spikes you're going to send sequentially. So how long that sequence of spikes is, is, you know, is going to be on the order almost equal to the dimensionality of the data manifold. Okay. And I told you that the dimension of the manifold is much smaller than the number of neurons in the layer, which is the ambient dimensionality, okay? And so if you now you take this into account, then you end up with this sort of 3D chip here, which still has N neurons wide and width, N synapses deep in depth, L layers high, but the active neurons, instead of all N neurons being active, you only need to activate D neurons because each of those is an NRE signal. And you only need order D, where D is the dimensionality of the manifold. And so now, if we replace, you know, uh, we keep n the square root of m, right? And we multiply by these signals, which are no longer scaling with n; they are fixed at D. Then we just have uh, a, um, you know, we we ju we just have now our. Um, I mean, energy scaling the number of neurons, right? So we get a linear scaling in number of neurons. And then we also have the area, you know, n, square, n squared, which is like m, also scaling linearly. And so now we have our energies proportional to our layer. They, they are both scaling linearly. So we can operate in parallel, okay? We can live in Manhattan. <laughs> so, 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 so what is the kind of like, you know, bottom line? I'm gonna wrap up in the next, last few slides here. The, the, the bottom line, you know, is this it dropping the number of signals from the number of neurons to the dimensionality in the case of GPT is 100, right? That's a hundredfold reduction in number of signals with a corresponding reduction in number amount of energy that the chip is uh, consuming. If you take ImageNet, these images have 150,000 pixels. So that's the number of neurons in the input layer. And it in the layers in the network, which are like 10,000 neurons wide and so forth but the dimensionality of the data manifold is on the order of 30, okay, 30 to 40. And so you're dropping this again, even like a thousand fold, and that can reduce the amount of energy from kilowatts to watts. Remember I said we need a 180 fold more energy efficient thing. So that's gonna give us that. And we can do this uh, AI for all business, librarian in your pocket. Okay, so have we achieved neural supremacy? Okay, so this is going to summarize what we've done. You know, these three systems we, we analyzed, we started with a 2D chip, that signal with binary signals. We got this exponent of two in terms of number of neurons in the network versus the energy the brain consumes. And then we went to 3D, but we kept the binary signaling and that exponent dropped to 1.5. And that actually couldn't operate in parallel because we didn't have, there's too much <laughs> heat to dissipate. 
And now if you go with 3D and you change the surrounding to energy, then that exponent becomes linear. Now people have measured from 100 million to 100 billion neurons, you know, in animals like rodents up to us humans, how much energy those brains use, okay? And as you can see here, that scaling is linear in the number of neurons. And so we've achieved neural supremacy. We have an exponent that matches what the brain does. Okay, so I'm gonna summarize it this way. Okay, just, uh, this is already a summary of the technical part, but put it in a larger context of the last 60 years, right? You know, so our conceptions of how brains compute have evolved from synaptocentric, what I call synaptocentric to axocentric to dendrocentric, right? In the, 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 in the synaptocentric case, we use these sort of rel U's, which draw away the negative part of the activation and just send the positive part. And this information, this is where you're sending on those wires with those binary signals. And then this information is aggregated and neuron sums these incoming um, activations, weighted, uh, weighted some of them. That's the spatial aggregation. And we realize this in GPUs and TPUs, they can do this matrix vector multiply really fast. And what neuromorphic engineers have been exploring over the last 30 years or so is this more axocentric, what I call an axocentric view. They, they recognize the fact that the axon, the output end of the neuron sends these spikes, okay? It doesn't just send activations, <laughs> some, some, you know, yeah, that's a fictitious quantity. And so now, and they were looking at encoding the information with the rate at which spikes are generated. There's all this neuroscience that says in sensory systems, that's what's carrying the information or the timing of one spike relative to the other, synchrony, all the stuff. And you know, then to extract this timing information or rate information, you have to integrate over time. So you integrate temporally instead of spatially. And people are built, like myself and others, have built neuromorphic chips based on these principles or this conception. And what I'm proposing here is what I call a dendrocentric uh, conception or abstraction. In this case, it's the rank of a spike in a sequence. The unit of information is a sequence of spikes from some subset of neurons in a layer. And where, which neuron fires and where it fires in the sequence is coding this energy number. That's the encoding. And so to actually figure out that these neurons spike, which neurons spiked and that they spiked in the right order, you have to pay attention to both space and time. So this special temporally inseparable uh, decoding, which is what, dendrites are doing. And if you do this, then you can build this 3D silicon brain that's neurally supreme. And are we there yet? Well, you know, <laughs> we are not, but the memory guys are. So like I said, the reason why your phone has this one terabyte memory chip is because they've actually built the Manhattan skyline, right? They, they've been able to fit wires and transistors up to 128 layers tall. This is just last year. Yeah, this slide is a year old. And then they stack eight of these chips in a single package. And that slides into your little skinny phone. And that's how you get your one terabyte, okay? And so we just have to follow the lead of the memory guys. And I've shown you how you can actually now do this because they only activate one layer at a time. But if you do the right coding, you can make all those transistors operate in parallel and therefore get a neurally supreme solution. Okay, unfortunately we're here but the technology is there. We just have to adapt it from these guys. Okay, and so I would like to thank the wonderful students who have come through my group over all these years and my uh, funding from federal as well as private funding. And um, I will stop here. Wow, that was quite an applause. <laughs> oh, let, let me just say, uh, before I read the questions that other people have given, I, I have a comment and a question. So first, um, that was incredibly inspiring in the sense that if someone said, what is it that this person studies? The, it would be an interesting heterogeneous answer of this is a way that thinking about engineering from physical principles gives us another way to organize how we see the nervous system. One way we do this now in groups like that are here is we take, you know, decent ideas from psychology and we parameterize them and we try to go down and let that structure the neural data. But this is a much more fundamental 
set of questions about what in the world is it that it evolved. And we know that it had to be um, energy efficient or it would lose to something that was just slightly a little more efficient than it. And, and so it's a, um, there's a lot more to learn from this, especially now that we can do these neural networks that can do things that we consider quite, um, quite amazing really. And I would say, I had one more comment for my question, which is uh, net talk was my start too into this world. It sucked me over to California <laughs> and I was just a couple hours south from you when you were starting with Carver Mead who yeah. inspired everybody. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll pop my technical question on the end. I'm gonna start um, with, this is from, well, I don't know who this is from, Anthony. Um, in the nervous system, all the wires if we assume that wires are similar to axons are not the same. The variation makes them differentially efficient in transmitting information. Mm -hmm. Are the wires in the neural networks similarly variable? If not, does that limit the efficiency or capacity of information representation of modern neural networks? Yeah, yeah, this is a great question. Actually, we have perfect wires, right? Because we use copper or metal or whatever in these chips, right? And uh, of course, as you make the wires, pack more wires, their cross sections become thinner, their resistance goes up. And there's, a, there's a, you know, we, so we are not just dissipating heat by the capacitance, the amount of charge you're moving around, we're just burning it like in your, your, your you know, uh, hot plate, you know, just put because of resistance. Um, you know, there's very interesting results if you look at, um, you know, Peter Sterling's uh, principles of neural design, summarizing a lot of this research that has been done. The diameters of axons actually correlate with the bits of the information they, they, they send, how fast they need to send it, you know, if it's some kind of activating some motor signal. And so, 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 so this is all optimized and there's very skinny axons down to sort of the limits where the noise in the channels would, would make a misfire. You know, but that's very slow information or information about always oh, a night or day and things like that. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so this is all optimized because volume. You know, you need yeah. So, so, so that's true. But unfortunately, um, in our case, we can't really control that. But we have we're not sending signal. You know, the mobility of an electron in a crystal solid state electronics is a million times faster than the mobility of an ion in an electrolyte. So that just, we just inherently have a speed advantage. So we don't have to struggle so much in terms of sizing, you know, axons and so forth. So that's the, the, the good news on our side, yeah. Um, uh, this next one is uh, from Kulyash uh, Devalova. Uh, extending your metaphor of Manhattan during uh, pandemic high density places could be more <laughs> vulnerable than the more distributed ones. Uh, will that be the case in your system architectures too? Um, if a pandemic, I missed the first part, sorry. Uh, uh, high density places proved uh -huh. to be more vulnerable than places that were more spread Oh out. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you're saying do you that- Do you plan to build that feature in by making it less, uh, I guess, attackable by distributing it in ways or something like that. Maybe maybe they could weigh back in to clarify. Yeah, the way you resist a pandemic is not to have DNA reproducing capability. <laughs> 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 so it's, 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 it's because the virus has hijacked that, right? And, and so, yeah, if we don't make these chips able to reproduce themselves, then we the virus is kind of hijacked. Right, right. <laughs> okay, the next Remember, it's a physical problem. thing. It's a physical thing that's computing. It's, it's yeah. not a software. <laughs> I am, um, um, this is from Pearl Chu, um, inspiring talk, thank you. Could you comment on modeling perturbations to the system? For example, perturbations that can be rectified or understanding those for which there's no point of return. Intrigued about how we can apply some of these principles to modeling human mental illness and restoring function. Um, yeah, this is a very interesting question. You know, I, I kind of, um, it's like, <laughs> You know, there's a paper 50 years ago, you know, kind of neuroscientists fix the radio. And, and there's a more modern version of that, you know, can a neuroscientist figure out a computer? You know, right. trying to fix health, you know, mental health when we don't even know what the code is. Right. You know, it's just like we're just flailing. So, so yes, this is going to help us fix it. If it's really true that these sequences, and, I, and there's lots of biological evidence and so forth. I didn't, I didn't present those papers and, and go deep in the biology side because 
I think people know more about that on your end, <laughs> but but pay attention to that. There's there's you know there's more and more evidence that dendrites you know are direction selective. If the if I have a dendrite here and the spikes coming you know like this do re mi versus right. you know fa re do you know you know in this do re mi it responds in the fa re do it doesn't right. So 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 it's the same weights. It's the same inputs everything but it you know so it's got this this local you know uh memory and it depends where the last spike came in and it's looking for the next spike to come in next to it going towards the somer and so forth so so this is exactly what you need to decode a sequence and and i built a model like this at wex right. with an mda you know uh care channels you know all the stuff you need spines and you need all that <laughs> to make it work but but you know so so, so there's more evidence that dendrite does and then there's more evidence like especially from places like hippocampus or temporal lobe where if you trigger off sharp wave ripples you find that in each of them a spike is occurring if you look across the population you're recording from multiple neurons you see these sequences in humans right. if you ask them to like learn some association tasks so this is work from Karim Zagu who was my first a PhD student, MD, PhD. He now has his own lab at um, NIH. Let, let me, let me, um, apologies to Anthony, who's asked a follow up question. I want to ask one more, which is um, so one of the things that you did through the whole talk was using engineering principles and neural networks as the example, current incarnations of neural exam networks as the example. You looked at how different um, features of this, architectural features, would have would scale with how energy would scale with that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so how could you pack it into more spaces and things like that? One thing you do have available in the brain are mitochondria, and mitochondria can be moved around. So you have mm -hmm. little basically reactors mm -hmm. in there yeah. that can generate energy, and yeah, yeah. Um, that motif I don't think has been exploited yet in terms of like really flexible power distribution capacity mm -hmm. on chips, or maybe I'm not caught up on power distribution and chips yet. Is that something you guys have thought about or is there new work on that? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a good question. Um, but you know, kind of these mitochondria uh, uh, producing energy, they're converting chemical energy, right? to electrical energy, essentially using that to pump ions across gradients, which is a battery that will then drive the electrical and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's a little bit like um, if you have an energy dense, you know, either is how gasoline cars work, right? They, they put gas in the engine, that's very energy dense, right? <laughs> Compared to, uh, you know, electricity and, and electrons in a battery. And so your battery in an electric car is just way bigger and weighs a lot more to, to you know, yeah. So this is the advantage the gas guys have, but then they're killing the planet, right? So, wow. so, 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 um, so, so that's the thing. So we are kind of stuck in this electrical thing because if we want to put in the, you know, chemical is definitely the densest energy source, right? But if you want to put in the plumbing to put, you know, it's kind of the solid state versus, you know, liquid state thing, you know, the brain is liquid state. And then, you know, you can rely on these chemical, that to distribute chemicals, but we are solid state and we can only move electrons. Electrons are the only thing that move inside a solid state system, right. you know? So, so yeah, you just, so, so, you know, the, you know, but, you know, I think what you're getting at is that, yes, and then people have said this, it's like, you know, beds don't flap their wings or planes don't flap their wings and everything like that. So we have different constraints when we yeah. build chips than the brain has when it builds these brain systems. But what people, this is, goes back to, yeah, so what do you keep and what do you throw out? Like what's right. giving you that neural supremacy? What's making a bird a bed, right? What do we mean by we're building a bird? You know, I've never seen a bird, you know, I've never seen any forest where the birds have cleared out like a mile of the forest and laid down asphalt so they can take off and land, you know? <laughs> you know conservation like, efforts, right? Yeah, I've never seen air traffic control telling two birds that, hey, you know, you, you guys are too close. You are three miles apart. Yeah. Planes have to maintain five miles separation in the air at all times, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so planes, you know, like planes are like, you know, you can run circles. I mean, birds can run circles around a plane. They're like, you're really supreme, you know? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm sorry to have to cut it off here, but it yeah. was <laughs> there's a couple more questions and um, I'll transmit them to you through email and I'll be okay. so, I'd like okay. to thank you again for coming. It was a fantastically inspiring talk. So thanks again. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.